I have to tell you, that when Vivek came to me and pitched his business plan, I was so impressed with him because he has so much passion. Even as a young entrepreneur, he's talking about taking on Bloomberg and, you know, doing these crazy things. So I invested in his company because I felt that incredible amount of passion, incredible amount of integrity. So Vivek, don't be nervous. It's always a pleasure to come and talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> so every time I meet him, he does the same thing. Every time. <laughs> so anyway, sir, uh, so... The, this time I've kept a format. Last time we uh, interviewed uh, the, uh, the CEO of Britannia also, where we discussed a lot of marketing strategies and things which may be relevant for the entrepreneurs here. So I was talking to you about uh, the quality of people out here. So we are largely owners of SME and MSMEs, extremely hungry to take our businesses to the next level. So I, you know, apart from the investment process, which we'll definitely want to take uh, you us through, because there are a lot of people who are interested in creating wealth from zero to 100 crores as one of your uh, YouTube videos has become quite viral these days. But at the same time, there are, uh, there are people who are owners of the business and they want their business to go to the next level. So maybe a few questions will be from their perspective and a few questions will be. Sure. And I will keep the house open uh, for all of you to participate in the queries because I have some bit of queries which I will take for my own business. But at the same time, uh, I'll be very glad if you guys have your questions and uh, sir would definitely participate in the answer. Uh, so, sir, I want to start uh, with plain, simple entrepreneur and uh, investor. So, you have all worked in U.S. for some time, and I believe you, were a, you actually uh, did coding also in U.S. for some time. Yes. And uh, when you came back, because your father had stopped working business, so probably there was a compulsion for you to come back, if I can use that word. And um, you started looking at the market uh, or the stocks, Keeping into your uh, existing background in mind, and I think you invested in Infosys because you understood the relevance of that, uh, that uh, coding and the technology piece and application of the same in the Indian market. So, so my question is that entrepreneur and an investor like you, what's the difference? Uh, I think Warren Buffett said it best, but let me first explain to you, you as an entrepreneur, um, you know, you feel, say, you started a packaged food business, it didn't work out, then you tried something else. But there's a very good uh, interview with Steve Jobs. I don't know if you've seen that, where he did a commencement address at Stanford University. Has anyone seen that on YouTube? Yeah, I think two, three of you have seen that. He has a very powerful lesson in there, which when I heard it, I immediately connected back with my life. He said, called connecting the dots. And let me explain to you what he means out there. He said that, when he was a student, he was also not very interested in studies. He wanted to take classes that interested him, not necessarily classes that were required to be taken. So <laughs> when he was in college in California, he took classes in calligraphy because he just enjoyed the process of calligraphy. And then he forgot about it, and then he moved on into technology in life. And 20 years later, when he was developing the Apple, uh, this calligraphy courses came back to him because he knew he could use font to make the Apple output much more pretty. And because he did that, he had such beautiful font in Apple and that's why the whole publishing, desktop publishing industry was born. The point he was making that really very little is wasted in your life. I mean, what the lessons he learned in calligraphy class came back to him 20, 30 years later when he was designing the Apple system. So you need to connect the dots sometime in your life, which is a similar thing happened to me as Vivek said. Uh, when I was uh, in America, I was working in the technology sector. I was a coder. I used to actually write hard code out there. And then I came back to India. And if you remember, in the 89, 90 India, there was a big Harshad Mehta boom going on in the stock market. And the cement shares were doing the best. Every cement share was going up. And I used to feel so inadequate because here I was a freshman MBA from America, a guy who used to read a lot. And I couldn't name two cement companies in the world. You know, I knew the Indian cement companies because I was here, but I couldn't name it. And then I thought, how am I so stupid? I mean, you know, everyone, my jobbers in the market, knew the price of cement in Raipur, in Ranchi, to the last 50 paisa, and I didn't know the prices of these things. I said, how am I going to go compete and make money out here? But then luckily for me, a uh, <coughs> couple of companies in the technology sector, like Infosys, went public. Now suddenly look at the advantage I had. No one in India understood technology. They're all looking at cement and steel and the old industries. I knew the new economy. I knew how these companies work. I knew that the fact they didn't have any assets was okay because they own intellectual property at that time. So because of my background in technology in California, 
I was one of the first few investors who got into uh, the technology shares. And those shares went up 100x, 200x, 500x over a period of time, which made us, people who invested in those shares, fairly well to do early on. But the broader point was that <coughs> you, you feel sometimes you're wasting your time by being in this particular business or doing this particular thought process. But sometimes in life it comes back to help you tremendously as my technology experience came back and helped me invest in technology stocks because I understood the value arbitrage that India was operating. I understood the huge opportunity ahead. I knew these market caps that they were, I mean, does anyone remember what market cap Infosys came public at? It came public in 93. Does anyone remember what the market cap it came public in? Take a guess. It was in 93. Huh? 10,000 crores? Okay. 50 crores. Yeah, Vivek is close. 30 crores, actually. 30 crores. It's a 3 crore equity, 10 to 100 rupee price, about 30 crore equity, it went public. Today, it's maybe 3 lakh crore, 3.5 lakh crore market cap. Forget the amount of dividends it's paid back, the amount of buybacks it's done. It's been one of the great, really super, super stocks of the world, if you will. So the point is that, Vivek, you know, sometimes your life connects in very strange ways that you're not, you know, fully aware of how some part or some help connects you there. So the first lesson, actually, in entrepreneurship is that <laughs> there's very rarely any wastage in life. You know, sometimes you remain curious, remain motivated. Things tend to work out. Right, right. Uh, right. So again, on an extension of that question is that uh, being an entrepreneur, we always uh, think of starting any product or any business with an intention of intention of continuing it for eternity. So we literally get married to our product or our business. Whereas a value investor. Uh, I think the intent would be pretty much the same, but at some point value investors start looking at it from an overpriced or expensive valuation perspective and would think of exiting that company. Now, in today's generation of entrepreneurs, where uh, especially the technology-led uh, entrepreneurship, where the product or the business is developed with a clear intent of selling it off to someone else, because there is someone who is as big a fool as you are who who's ready to put money in your company at a higher valuation. So do you think the whole path of entrepreneurship, because you have seen the whole uh, evolution of entrepreneurship in India, the whole path of in entrepreneurship has evolved where people are no more building business for long-term sustainable. I mean, there, there are two thoughts Vivek, you mentioned out here. The first thing, if an entrepreneur is building something to sell it to somebody else, as you said, the greater full theory, that's generally, in my view, a poor entrepreneur. You know, a great entrepreneur wants to change the world. You know, I, when you came to me, you didn't talk about, you know, doing this and selling it to someone. You talked about changing how data and information is kept, and that's what attracted me to you. So it is very important that the entrepreneur has that kind of big vision, passion, and he, he wants to grow with that business. But let me take it from another perspective. I was speaking at an ANME conference yesterday, and the talk there was a technological disruption that happens. And there are two kinds of businesses. Uh, Warren Buffett said he wants to invest in a business forever, that he will be able to hold forever. For example, he's held Coke in his portfolio for 40 years. He's held uh, American Express for 50 years, Washington Post for 60 years. A lot of businesses lend themselves to forever investing. But given the cycle of technological disruption that we are seeing right now, the amount of disruption that we're seeing, sometimes you have to look at more what are called timely businesses. And let me just take you through both of them to see uh, you know, what the thought process in uh, this is. <coughs> Uh, those of you who have seen the video would know this answer, but in the 90 years of the U.S. stock markets, in 1922, uh, this thing, what has been the best performing stock in America? Does anyone who has not seen the video have a guess? What has been the best performing stock in America? Apple has been only listed for about you know, 30, 40 years, so uh, it's been a great stock, but it's certainly by no means the best stock. It's up maybe 300x since 1980. So, G. Uh, G, again, a good stock, but again, recently it's just collapsed completely. It's come back to the price it was in, I think, 2005 or six, something in that neighborhood. Huh? Again, a good example. The examples are good, but it's not the best stock. The best stock may surprise you. Uh, huh? Yes, of course, he knows because he talks to me all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, the best stock is Philip Morris, which is a cigarette company, right? So here's it, human habits don't change, okay? We always want to smoke, we always want to drink, we always want to gamble, these habits don't change. So Philip Morris, uh, from its price in 1920 to 2018, 
again, you don't answer this question, Yash. How many times has it been up? How many times has it multiplied your wealth? <laughs> Go higher. Huh? Go higher. 2,000 times. Anyone out there? It's up 2 million times. Okay? So in 90 years, it's up 2 million times. But that's not the point. The point is in 90 years, if something goes up 2 million times, what is the compound annual rate of that growth? What, is the, <coughs> what has been the rate of growth? The rate of growth is actually 16, 17%. Okay? That's what it's grown at. Nothing phenomenal. You say 16% I with the bank interest in mill right? But something growing at 16, 17% consistently, you know, over 90 years makes you extraordinarily rich. We'll talk about that later uh, in the second. So, the, and this is, just imagine this is an industry which has so much regulatory ban, so much social disfavor, so much price increase, so much taxes, but people want to smoke, smoke, and they pay, keep paying higher prices for it. The company doesn't have to invest in advertising anymore, doesn't have to invest in technology. So they take the cash and give it back as dividends. So we include that. The stock has been one of the great performers uh, in the business. So there are two components. The timely business also throws out a lot of cash. So it can generate it back to the shareholders. And people sometimes don't look at dividends. They look at growth. And that's a mistake to make because dividends are a very important component of your return. So make sure that the dividend is you know, sacred to your investing process. You need to include your dividends back. The other thing about tobacco stocks that I must add, what has been the best performing stock in Japan? Japan tobacco. What has been the best performing stock in India over the last 30 years? ITC. What has been the best performing stock in UK? Diageo, which makes liquor. Okay? So a lot of these sin stocks, okay, liquor, tobacco, have been some of the best performing businesses over long periods of time. And the very few businesses itself that will keep growing at 15, 16% over 30, 40, 70 year period. So it's very rare to find those businesses. On the other hand, you have a lot of businesses that are destructed. I just did a study yesterday that suppose you started a company in 1950 uh, <coughs> and you did well. It would spend probably 60 years in the S&P 500. 60 years you'll spend in the S&P 500. Today, if you start the same company, it would spend about 18 years in the S&P 500. So there's a lot of destruction going on. Companies are shunted out, new companies are born. And yet, to get to a billion dollar in valuation, to get a billion dollar in valuation, used to take a company roughly 20 years to get to a billion dollar in valuation. Now, there's a company in America called Scooter, which makes electric, electric uh, scooters, right? It got there in 15 months. A couple of our own homegrown boys, the guy who launched uh, Oyo, for example, uh, Baiju, the learning app, they've all gone to become unicorns, billion dollar valuation company, few years after they started. So there's a great tussle going on in the world between timeless businesses, which is the kind we like to invest in, buy and forget, hold on, generate it out there. But business itself is becoming destructive. There's a creative destruction that goes on uh, in the business. There's a company in China called Ant Financial, for example. You'd be uh, aware of that, Vivek, <coughs> which has just killed the local banks, local sub, because it offers everything on a, on a smartphone app. So in terms of destruction, what is the biggest destruction I see coming in the next 10, 20 years? Uh, which, <coughs> let me ask you this question. I don't know about Calcutta, but in Bombay, you're valued by three things. Where, <coughs> which school do your kids go to? It's very hard to get admission in a school there. Uh, which club you're a member of? You know, so it's, if you're in a Taligan's club, you're high up there. And where's your parking spot? Okay, Parking is a huge problem in Bombay, right? So in a good place, say in Park Street, what would a good parking spot cost out there? Does anyone have a guess? 20 lakhs, that's a pretty amount. In the society where I live in South Bombay, in Foundry, it costs about 50 lakhs, you know? So it's sometimes more expensive than the car. The parking spot is more expensive than the car. But it costs about 50 lakhs. So the question I pose to an audience that uh, in 25 years, what do you think will be the cost of that parking spot? What will be the cost of the parking spot? Yeah, you've also seen my video, I'm sure, right? Good. Well, that's good. Right. But why did I say zero? Maybe you can help us answer the question. Why do you think it becomes zero? <laughs> a 
is very good. He's absolutely right. He got the gist of what I was saying absolutely accurately. What will happen is that we'll go to what is called first an electric vehicle car and then an autonomous vehicle car. What is an autonomous vehicle car? It will be driven uh, <coughs> without the help of a driver. It will be driven by software completely. Once that happens, suppose I finish this meeting out here, I just take out my phone, click an app button, say take me to Alipur where I'm staying, it will take me and then drop me and then go to pick up somebody else. So just like, uh, I mean for example, in 1900 horses were very common, right? But can you ride a horse today? No, you want to go to maybe Baliganj club and ride a horse out there, otherwise you can't ride on the street. Same way you like to drive a car today, right? You like to go on the street, get the feel of a drive, won't be able to do it anymore. You'll have to go to racetrack and do it. All the cars will be autonomous. If everyone is autonomous and it's a fleet, you don't need to own a car. Think about it, how much time do we drive a car? Actually, it's 5% time, 10% of the time. Most of the time it's parked under an office or under a house or in a club, right? So we'll all own these autonomous cars, be fairly cheap, fairly easy to get to out there. If you don't own a car, why do you want to own a parking spot, right? So my, my big contention is that these parking spots will go down to zero in value as he correctly pointed out. I tell that to my wife and she throws me out of the house. So <laughs> she doesn't let me sell my parking spot. But the fact of the matter is that it's, uh, <coughs> I mean, just because we think a parking spot is always valuable and we should always hoard it and do teen rakhlete but you know, the technology does not allow this. It keeps, uh, you know, us thinking about things. I mean, I'll give you another example from my own financial career. When I started my career in the stock exchange, 1989, I got in luckily through a quota. You know, the BSE was selling 50 cards and they wanted to encourage professionals to come in there. So I applied and I managed to get one. I paid a princely sum of 6 lakh rupees in 1989 for the card. At that time, the free market was maybe 10, 12 lakh. So it wasn't that much of a bargain, but I got it was 6 lakh. Within three years, the value of the card had gone to 4 crore rupees, right? At that time, <laughs> being a broker, the BSE, was like being a train conductor on a busy train route, okay? Everyone begged you for a seat, everyone paid you any amount of money to just do their business. And yet, BSE had 90% market share. 30 years later, in 2018, BSE has 10% market share, NSE has 90% market share. What happened? Technological disruption, right? The BSE was complacent, it had an outcry system, it had jobber-based system, it had, uh, you know, antiquated Bombay club, NSC came, opened the membership, anyone could become a member, pay 25, 50 lakh deposit, you can become a member. Electronic system, so people from Raipur could trade, people from Calcutta could trade, people with, could trade from Bombay. <coughs> Better price discovery, the jobbers used to take a lot of goal in between as they say, but here it was transparent to the screen, so you could tell the client I bought it for you at 2010 and instantly confirm it to him. The balance of gravity shifted towards the NSC. So BSE went from 90% market share to 10%, NSE went from 10% to 90%. BSE also digitized, it was too late. The market had already gone, shifted to NSC, right? So these kind of technological disruptions will happen to your businesses tomorrow, is happened to my business, which is the broking business. So the trend is you need to move to a higher value addition business. For example, textile business becomes commodity. So how do you survive in the textile business? By going into fashion, by keeping on moving up the value scale. You're, Broking business became obsolete. How did we survive in this? By moving into wealth advisory, asset management, you know, giving uh, clients better service than just simple transactional broking. So while we always look for a business that can sustain for 10, 20, 30, 50 years, increasingly we'll have to grapple with a lot of technological change going on in the market. And the way you survive in the technology business is to keep moving up the value chain, all right? Don't think of yourself as a limiting person. I'll give you another example before I finish up this. It was again in my presentation, so those of you who have seen the presentation will be repetitive for you. But the two biggest companies in the photography market in the 1980s when I was growing up were, does, of course you're all younger than me, huh? Kodak is one and Polaroid was the other one, right? The fact is we've now as per capita do so many more f f photographs, right? The amount of selfies we click is, you know, almost astronomical, right? And yet the two companies most entrenched in photography are bankrupt, okay? Kodak is bankrupt, Polaroid is bankrupt. Why is that? The photography market has exploded, right? But why are the two dominant companies in the photography business bankrupt, okay? The answer is that Kodak and Polaroid thought they were <coughs> in the limited, you know, 
printing of photograph business. They were run by people with chemistry backgrounds. So they were always interested in how you print a photograph out, how you display it on an amble. They could not understand that people will exchange it through electronic means by clicking selfies, posting it to each other, and being able to snap. They always believed a photograph had to be printed. So the guys who made the money were understood the electronics part of the business, not the chemistry part of the business. And that was the fatal flaw that they have. So any business, if you think yourself too narrowly focused, you know, you don't think, if you think you're in the taxi business or you think you are in the, you know, you know, moving about business, but not in the transportation business, you won't see Uber coming. You say, I'm taxi, I'm thinking of myself in the taxi business, but think bigger, you need to be in the transportation business. You need to keep reinventing yourself. Okay? That is the lesson that 30 years of the stock market have taught me, that uh, there are some timeless businesses, and if you get them, you back up the truck and buy as much as you can, or you stay in that business. But very, very few businesses meet that test of being a time, timeless business. The rest of the business, you will destruct yourself, reinvent yourself, destruct yourself, reinvent yourself. And unless you're educated on top of this thing, I don't think you'll be uh, you know, a very successful entrepreneur without being reinventing yourself every few years. Right, sir. Uh, <laughs> sir, the <clears throat> members of this chapter, I've been interacting with them for almost a year now, and I see the, the propensity to invest in direct equity is pretty low with the members here who are still coming from us, that strata of society which has some, some bit of say, financial savings to park it into direct equity investment. Well, when I interact with them, and all of them are stock users, so when I interact <laughs> with them, uh, I've they're all smart to, people, Madhav. They're smart That one's guaranteed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> if they use stockage, they're smart. <laughs> I'm an investor, so I have a personal interest in it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, um, so when I ask them that why aren't you uh, putting your money in direct equity, so the inevitable answer which I get from them is that we are too busy in our existing business. And uh, I believe I'll rather put my money in my existing business where I have more control than giving it to the other uh, other entrepreneur who is running his company. Uh, whereas uh, we have a, seg a segment of society like you who, are, who believes in you know, empowering the entrepreneurs either by investing in listed or in the unlisted space. But you know, at, at some point of time, uh, these people, they would miss an opportunity to invest in good stock, which can probably generate more return on capital for them than their own business. So do you think, the, uh, can you suggest any cheat sheet or anything which they can do or should, would you recommend them to actually invest in equity and focus more on their existing business and not look out for other equity investments in the listed space? Yeah, Vivek, it's an involved question. The first advice I'll give you is that if you're running a business, you should keep running that, okay? Uh, I truly believe that you are your own best capital allocator. So if you are a lawyer or you are a hairdresser or you are you know, a building contractor, and you generate a sustainable return on investment in your business, and your business requires capital, the first thing you should always do is invest in yourself. Just mm -hmm. like I would not recommend investing in stocks. You invest in your business. Your Apple, who knows, can become Bloomberg tomorrow, right? So I'm very, I want you to encourage you to invest in your own business because you don't know where your business can take you, right? right? So I would encourage all of you to do that. <laughs> a lot of businesses can't take more capital. Okay? If Vivek starts generating 100 crores a year in cash flow, his business won't require that much capital. Then you go into investment. That is a fair point. But the first uh, principle of this, Vivek, is that you invest in yourself. Okay? And your strength, your area of competence. You do that. That's what I, my suggestion to you. Beyond that, if your business can't take more capital or the return on capital is not great or it's stuck in accounts receivable, stuck in inventory, then I understand. Then you start moving to investment. So it'll be a two-stage process. But always benchmark yourself, what is your return on investment capital, okay? It can't be that you're using your services at zero, using your father's uh, factory warehouse, which costs you zero, and then making a capital. You should do an honest evaluation. Is your business earning a return on capital? Either GSEC bond is at 8%, you should be generating 10% return on capital with true cost accounting done in there. If you do that, keep investing in yourself. That is the best investment you'll ever do. But if your business cannot generate the kind of return, or it can't use that much more capital, then the public market is a good place to go in and look. All right, all right, sir. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, attendees here who are investors also in market full time at the early age. Now they had a question which they posted to me right now that investing is an extremely boring activity, and it involves uh, 
full dedication in reading and just trying to figure out things which are out of the box. Uh, they wanted to know at your early, early stage of when you decided to invest in the market, how did you deal with that boredom of involved in the uh, investing process? Uh, you know, my wife used to say that, you know, reading, reading, no acting. <laughs> That's what she used to criticize me about. Because it's a business that, you know, it's like watching grass grow. It can get pretty boring, right? So I used to have these fantastic theories. Uh, I used to tell in the 80s when I was just starting my business that I think India will become a $2 trillion economy and that the poor capita consumption of, you know, at that time used to be Xerox copies, could be Gillette, whatever. You know, we have one per hundred people using a shaving machine today. This will go to five per hundred. And you know what that will happen to my stock once that happens. So all these fantastic theories, I used to keep talking to her about that. <laughs> because I used to read about them, right? So my best example stock that uh, I became well known. How many of you have seen the film uh, Diwar? This Amitabh Bachchan. Everyone's seen the film. So good, you'll relate to the anecdote I'm about to tell you. There's a scene in Diwar which uh, you'll all remember. <coughs> Amitabh Bachchan, Parveen Babi, they're saying in a bar at Oberoi, right? And, um, you know, Amitabh Bachchan was a, a bit of a crook at that time in that movie. And Parveen Babi is a lady of easy virtue out there. But they've become friends, which is great. So they're sitting in a bar, and this Parveen Babi is in a nice, provocative dress. And she swivels towards the camera and says, you know, this is a very strange thing. Why? Why? Why is it drinking this water? Why is it drinking this water? Why is it drinking this water? Remember, this is a timeless business. Alcohol is a timeless business. People will always uh, want, uh, you know, alcohol or drink with buddies or, you know, do something, um, you know, social, if you will. So, when I came to the stock market and I started looking, maybe in 2001 2 you could buy the entire alcohol industry in India, okay, the liquor industry in India, which includes beer, spirits, wine, all of that, for maybe $150 million US. You know, the United Spirits and breweries own 50% of the market, together worth about $150 million, 500-600 crore rupiah was there. So the entire industry was worth about $200 million, let's say, okay, because they own 50% of the market share. Now, think about the the way I was saying about India at that time, we had a billion people, we had <laughs> GDP growing at 8% at that time, we had every year, I, I forget the exact number, a huge percent of people become 21 years of age, which to me meant they could start drinking, right? And we were <laughs> still a non-Islamic country, so there's no social prohibition against drinking. And we realized how young people throughout the world behave, you know, they want to go to a happy hour, they want to have a good time, whatever. And yet these companies were available <coughs> so, so cheap uh, to us that time. And the way I used to explain it to some of my friends who are back there in the audience, I would tell them that, so say McDowell was worth 200 crores at that time. The value of McDowell's was 200 crores. So I would tell them that, okay, you can buy 10% of McDowell's for 20 crore rupees, correct? It was 200 crores, 10% to 20 crore rupees. And what does that mean? That means every 10 bottles of beer sold, one is yours. That's the way I used to think. Ownership of a business. Every 10 bottles people drink beer, one I have sold. That's the way I used to think out there. Or, or I said, you can take the 20 crores and buy a flat in NCPA, which is in one of the prestigious buildings in Bombay. B score may shayad milta, shayad pachi score lag I don't know, but it was that experience. Now think about what I'm saying, the value proposition available to you, that you could buy a flat <coughs> in NCPA and probably live comfortably, but nothing beyond. Or you could buy 10% of India's alcohol business. Think about what I'm saying. Look at the value proposition sometimes that uh, these opportunities offer us in the stock market. So <coughs> if you do that kind of math, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, to look at the stock market. You know? Right. So, so I, I, I've interacted with you quite a lot, and I see that your approach is extremely top-down approach. You actually try to figure out the size of the market opportunity and then pick the best candidate in that opportunity. Is that true, sir? Is this, uh, can I conclude this? I, Vivek, I do both, to be honest with you. I will do top down. I, uh, for example, I saw the, after the tech boom in India with the computer software boom, like I told you about the Infosys, we approached TCS doing well. I realized that we, telecommunication become cheap in India. Finally, it had become, you know, regular telecommunication costs. So there's a big boom in BPO businesses in India. So it's a top-down approach. You look at BPO and buy there. But occasionally I look at companies also from a bottom-up approach. They're just too cheap. Uh, so 
Uh, for example, the public sector stocks which I bought in my career, I bought a company called Bharat Electronics uh, at about 40 rupees, which implied a market cap of 300 crore rupees. They were a dominant supplier of defense equipment to the government of India. 40 rupees, two buck dividend, that is a 5% yield, these stocks were available for. So I did the bottom-up analysis, I realized as soon as the turnover went over 1,600 crores, it would start hitting the bottom line, and which is exactly what happened. The stock, luckily for me, went up from the price at 40 to almost 200x over a period of the next 15, 16 years. Company didn't do anything great, it grew at 12, 15%, but the sheer amount of profitability that came because of the leverage they had made that a great stock uh, to buy. So to be honest, I've done both. Uh, I, <coughs> if you ask me, I tend to do more bottom-up than top-up, but I enjoy top-up also because it gives me the intellectual satisfaction of figuring out a trend. Right, right, sir. Uh, sir, before I uh, keep the uh, question answer open for the floor members, uh, the last question is because quite a lot of us are entrepreneurs here. Uh, if you can give a pictorial view or uh, maybe a 10,000 feet view of uh, the fundraising plan which an entrepreneur should do. When an entrepreneur should <coughs> say that, yes, I'm ready now to go to the market to raise fund. Because you have seen all scale of entrepreneurs raising from, from the market. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer this two parts. You know, first part is what do outsiders look for in an entrepreneurship? You know, I think uh, <coughs> when you look, f when someone on the outside looks at an entrepreneur, you know, they want uh, intelligence, they want passion, and they want integrity. Okay? And if you have intelligence and passion but don't have integrity, you know, you lose it all, right? So people won't invest in you or that, you know? The good, really good investors tend to look for the matrix of these three. All these three things must be in, uh, you know, close collaboration with each other. The integrity part, the intelligence part, and the, you know, promise, the opportunity, the passion part of you. But integrity is very, very important. You know, your alignment of interest between the person who's putting the money and you should be there, and you must treat that capital as sacred as yours. It's not that because you got cheap capital or access to capital, that can be blown away in a fancy car or holiday or you know, a great office structure. You know? So it's very important to uh, kind of through that. When is <coughs> the right time to raise money? I don't really know, to be honest with you about that. But typically, if you're a good entrepreneur today in India and you have like three, four years results, people will come to you. you know? People's, there's so much private equity fund going on, so many VC funds deals running that if you're a guy who's shown a scalable opportunity and has produced a good set of numbers, I think people will come to your door. You don't have to go to them. Right, so, I mean, uh, maybe I can just rephrase this question that is it a good time for an entrepreneur of, uh, say, old school businesses, uh, turnover of 50 crores to 400 crores, is it a right time for them to look at equity market fundraising for coming five years perspective? I think so, I think so, because, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Again, one of the wisest persons I know in the stock market who's seen 50 a career in the stock market has seen all the booms, busts, whatever, and I think someone asked him a very poignant question. He said, okay, you were lucky. You were the right place at the right time. The index was 800 when you started today. It's 36,000. But what about us? You know? So what do you think they asked him, actually, is the best time to, the best time in your career to have invested? Was it in the 80s? Was it in the tech boom? Was it in the India liberalization boom? Which was the best error to invest in India in the last 40 years? And without missing a beat, he said, the best error to invest in India is the next 20 years, right? Because the opportunities in the next 20 years will be far superior than they were in the last 30 years, as good as they were in the last 30 years. Like I told you myself, the index went from 636,000, 60x move in the index itself. But the wisest man I know feels the best opportunities will be in the next 20, 30 years. Why is that? Because <coughs> we are a nation of 1.2 billion people, so you have a natural market that is so huge. How many countries have a kind of market? China has this market, we have this market, okay? We dwarf every other market. There's a rising aspirations for the entire class in terms of consumption. So the India that grew at 3%, so-called Hindu growth rate is now over. We'll grow at least at 6%. Bad governments will make us grow at 6%, 7%. Good government will do a 10%. I don't think we wouldn't get a good government in India, so don't hold your breath. I don't, I won't hold my breath. I think we grow at 6, 7%, but that's good enough for us. And as India's economy is about 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion, 
it get to two trillion dollars, it get to four trillion dollars, you know. Maybe it gets in eight years, maybe it gets there in ten years, you know, I don't know that. But look at the tremendous opportunities that will be unleashed once, uh, you know, we get to twelve trillion dollars. See, what happens is that if you grow economy at seven, eight percent a year, your economy doubles every ten to twelve years, right? So in a generation, the economy goes up, uh, I think it goes from one to two, two to four, four x move in the index in one generation out there. If you go at 12 or 13 percent, you basically do 16x move, okay? So it's very important, morally very important, because you have such unemployment, such poor backward standards of living, that our government try and grow this at 10, 12 percent. But I'm saying it doesn't happen, we'll still do a 4x economy in the next 10, 20 years, right? Which is great for improving living standards um, or whatever of people.